You're listening to Garibaldi Red, a Nottingham Forest podcast brought to you by Nottinghamshire Live. Hello and welcome to a second podcast of the week, a bite-sized one as we look at Nottingham Forest boys from Brazil. And with that in mind, I'd like to be joined by the preeminent South American football expert, Tim Vickery, today. Tim, thanks for joining me. Are you well? I am, yeah. Yeah, very well. Looking forward to, to kicking the ball around over the next few minutes. Yes, that, as I say, thank you for joining me. Um, it's not long ago that Nottingham Forest were signing some pretty terrible players and now they're signing some top players from Brazil. It's a bit of a culture shock for fans over in Nottingham, certainly. What are your thoughts, first of all, on Forest targeting the Brazilian domestic league? It's quite unusual for a club in this country to kind of bypass Ajax and the French teams, isn't it? And the Portuguese teams. Yeah. No, I mean, that, that, that's, that's been their business model. They assume the risk of bringing over from South America. Some moves don't come off, but those that do, they can then sell on to someone bigger. Um, I think probably leaving the European Union has, has helped flexible uh, make more flexible the the entry requirements so that that's one thing but also look at brighton look at how well that's working you know and moses caicedo and alexis McAllister, especially caicedo i thought destroyed liverpool the other day mm-hmm. and that's two that they got in very very cheap and moses caicedo cost five million you know mm-hmm. it's extraordinary um because brighton have understood that if they're going to compete with clubs with more resources, they've got to be cuter. And clearly Forrest uh, are beginning to follow the same path. You know, bring in, well, Lodi is an established player in European football already who they've brought in. But the other two, very different players at different stages in their careers, perhaps, Scarpa and uh, and, and, and Danilo, that is straight in from, from the Brazilian market. And in, and then in the case of Danilo, there's a sell-on value there if that one goes goes very well. So, and part of this is some of the smaller Premier League clubs trying to do what the likes of Benfica and Porto have done so well. And I suppose this is relevant in the light of what Agnelli has just said, you know, leaving Juventus. His worry that the Premier League is marginalising all the other championships in Europe uh, and um, well, the, the fact that Forrest can attract Daniel is uh, um, evidence that, on that at least, Daniel is probably right. Um, can you tell us a bit about Daniel? Obviously, he seemed to be linked with some very big clubs in the Premier League, and the deal didn't come off. How come Forrest have managed to get the deal over the line in the t- difficult January market as well? I think there are two reasons bef- uh, for this. Um, we can get into what type of player he is in just a minute, but two reasons that it's Forrest and not someone else. One is he just dipped second half of last year. I mean, second half of last year was was short because of the World Cup. You know, we, we ended b- um, before the World Cup. But he, he just dipped second half of the, of the season. Now, I think... My reading of this is it has a lot to do with his first Brazil call-up, which he got in, in June when they went to uh, Japan and South Korea. And he didn't get got on the field. And when he came back, he, 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 wasn't, he didn't look the same player. Mm. And I, I, I think, and I, I could be wrong here, this is just an interpretation. It, it could just be relentless football taking its toll. But it could also be, wow. This level is a bit, it's a bit higher than I thought. And you can see that central midfielders, a lot of Brazilian central midfielders have struggled in European football um, because the, the the defensive lines in South America and in Brazil, usually they play so much deeper. Mm. So there's much, much more space on the field, you know, for the, for the, the central midfielder can, to receive the ball and then, and then define what he's going to do with it. Uh, in top-level football, and this was a tendency in the World Cup as well, with the defensive lines higher than they had been in Russia uh, 2018. There isn't that space. You've got to play quicker. Uh, and there aren't that many Brazilian central midfielders who've adapted to that easily. So perhaps that that's something that happened with, with Daniel Orp. And I've, we've seen this with many players down the years. You know, when they, they get the step up, ooh, 
oh, not quite as good as I thought I was. It's it's a natural stage, I think, in the in the developments. The other reason I think that he's ended up at Forest and not perhaps at, at all, with all due respect to uh, the twice European champions, um, and not at a, a, a bigger club, uh, is the way that the market goes now. Because what the European clubs want to do is they want to take the South Americans as early as possible. Mm. Um, the the Real Madrid deal for Vinicius Junior, I think, is is emblematic in this because at the time when they paid what over forty million quid for him, he was sixteen. He hadn't played a senior game. They had to wait until he was eighteen to get him, but they bought him when he was sixteen. And it just, just this is madness. This is madness. Look at it now. Looks a fabulous piece of business, you know. You won in the Champions League, mm. uh, so what the European clubs want to do is buy young, get them across the Atlantic as soon as possible. That that that's been the model. Now they recognise, I think, that there are risks in this in terms of the human being, but in terms of the footballer, you can only gain by getting them out of Brazilian football, getting them into top level football as quickly as possible. So that's what they want to do. So. Uh, if you've reached 22 and you haven't been sold, tough. Mm. And Palmeiras, they've been burnt a couple of times. They had a uh, couple of potential wonder kid wingers, Gabriel Veron and Wesley, being linked with everyone. Huge sums of money. Palmeiras didn't sell. And they thought, we haven't got a lot out of these players yet. Let's keep them. Let's keep them a little while. Let's keep them a year. Get another year out of them and they'll be worth more. But 19 than they were at 18. Didn't happen with both of them. Mm. Both of them, you know, there were injuries or off the field problems, and they ended up selling Gabriel Veron to Porto for ten euro, ten million euros, I think. And uh, Wesley's just gone to another Brazilian club for three. Oh wow! And, okay. that, and that, that's much. And Wesley's hit the twenty-two mark. That, that, uh, that's much, much less than they imagined that they were going to get. So you got to get the timing of the move right. Yeah, you know, if they'd hung on to him for another six months, he's twenty. Then he's twenty-two, and then you, you're you're into panic mode. Maybe you're not going to do the deal. So uh, I don't think he'd have gone to Forest in the last window. Hmm. I think he might have gone to Arsenal a year ago, but Palmeiras were in the in the Club World Championship, the Club World Cup, which plays huge over. It's massive, and they, they've never won it. They hmm. wanted to win it, so there was no way they were going to sell him then. But if they hang on to him just that little bit longer, there's a chance that they won't they won't get anything like as much. Mm. It's the way that the the, the market mm. has gone, you know. So Forrest have got in there before he's 22. Um, they've paid a lot a lot of money for him, but less than ideally Palmeiras would have got would have got for him, and less than I think that Palmeiras definitely would have got for him maybe at this time last year. Mm. So it's knowing that the, the understanding the timing of the market. I think is a huge part of this deal. So following on from that then, um, what kind of player is he and what are the expectations in the short or medium term? Kind of bearing in mind that on one hand, it's very difficult to adapt to the Premier League, the pace of it, especially as a central midfielder. But on the other hand, he's got yeah. some countrymen here that that might help him out. So what, what are you expecting? I like him very much. Um, and uh, well, this is, although he's 21, we're not talking about a promise here. We're talking about a reality. You know, the last three seasons, the first two of them, Palmeiras won the Libertadores, South America's Champions League. And then last year, they won the league. Hmm. And he was a vital player in all in all of those three. So, you know, that's that ain't promise. That, that, that's reality. Um, I wondered when he first got in the side, I wondered. I didn't think he was, certainly defensively, I didn't think he was there. And it was lovely to be proved wrong. And it was great to see his development. And the coach he was working with at Palmeiras, Abel Ferreira, Portuguese, there's a, there's a little bit of a kind of young Mourinho about him. Hmm. Very good at developing players. And I think he developed Danilo really, really well. So uh, what he is, is a, he's, a, he's left-footed, live central midfielder, dynamic. That dynamism, I think, is the key word. Quick, quick to see the game, quick to win the ball, quick to give the pass, quick to go. Um, you could maybe make a comparison 
with a player who I think has been grossly maligned by pundits and, and which is Fredge at Man United, mm. who's left footed with a with a terrific engine. Mm. Uh Danilo adds yet, I don't because I think Fred, if you let him play, and that was the problem at United, they weren't. If you let him play, I think he's he's got more in the final third than Danilo has at the moment. But what Danilo can do is win the ball, knit the play. And his passing is is all right. And then he's on the move to 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 link up with the next phase of play to link the game again. So he's dynamic, he's quick around the field. And I think those virtues will help him, should help him, bed in reasonably quickly to the Premier League. And in terms of Scarpa, you mentioned obviously the age profile of the younger players from Palmeiras. He, he's 29. Yeah. What can we expect from him? Did you think the ship had sailed on him getting a big European move? Well, the great thing about it is he wants to be there. You know, this isn't a player who's gone for financial reasons or anything like that. Hmm. This is a player who... And he reads books. You know, his Instagram page, his little book reviews and stuff. Yeah. You know? So I think he's one of those, one of those who's who's very culturally curious. And uh he didn't want to end his career, his peak years, without this experience. So uh you know, he's not he's not there because an agent pushed him there or anything like that. You know, he's there because he he wants to see what it's like. He wants he wants to live that, and I think that's uh, that's important. Um, that helps him bed in. I remember when he first came through. It was here in Rio with Fluminense, and at the time he was in the same side as as Richarlison. Mm -hmm. And uh, when Watford came in from Richarlison, I have to say I didn't see it, and. I would talk, you know, on the on the, the underground, going to Fluminense games. I would talk to fans, and I would say, "Did you see it with Richarlison?" And only one fan said, "Yeah." The most, I, I even talked to a club director who didn't see it with Richarlison, and all of them thought that Scarpa was the star, and not Richarlison. Part of that is because he's a ball player, you know. He's uh, and the, the left foot is lovely, gorgeous left foot that he's that, that, that he's got. Um, but for myself. I didn't imagine him um, in top-class European football because I worried that the pace and physicality might be too much of a problem. He's he's the kind of ball player who thrives in that space between the deeper defensive lines. Um, in in, in top-class European football, where the lines are much closer together, the game's quicker. It's hard, and and, he, and he's not he's not physically strong. It's harder for for a player like that to get on the ball and 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 to make to, to have an impact on the game, um, but I think he's bright and I'll be interested to see how he works his way through this, uh, because you know a left foot's a wonderful thing to have from set pieces if nothing else you know, mm. uh, and he was in he was in really good form last year played very very well last year in the side that that won the league I and mean, there were. There were people pushing him for him for him to be included in, in the Brazil side. That was a bit silly. That that's the kind of home field thing. You know, they're quite bitter about the fact that so few domestically based players get in the team. And there's always a push for more domestically based players to be put in the in, in, in the team. Now is with Forest, no one argues says, yes, Scarpa should be in the national team. That you know, that ship has sailed because they're, they're not going to be seeing him every week again, uh, every week now. Um so uh, I'm intrigued to see how that one goes. Um, and I think his best intelligence, well, I think that the, the two best virtues that, he, that he's got <coughs> are that he wants to be there and that he's intelligent. Hmm. So I'm interested to, to see how he finds a way to make himself uh, useful in the games. What, what have yeah. been your early impressions? Well, I was going to say, I think he started very well. It's funny hearing you say about the physicality. In the Premier League games, he's done really well for 45 minutes. And then he's faded very dramatically. Yeah. Yeah. And you just wonder if the physicality has been too much for him. And I suppose the hope is that a half season of it, he adapts. And then next season, he really pushes on. I don't think he would have played as much as he had, but for a one year in Lingard getting injured, I think he would have been bedded in a little bit more. But Forest fans have certainly taken to him. I don't know if you've picked that up, but he's proven very popular with his Rubik's Cube and his skateboard and his, his books and it, it, the way he's buying in. So, yeah, I think he's... He could be a cult hero if he just delivers on the yeah. pitch as well. 
Um, yeah, it's, 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 it's a lovely story. You know, you get the impression that there's an interesting human being in there. Yeah. Not, yes, a great, not a great football watcher. Oh, uh, okay. No, he's not really into that. Into that, I think he likes doing other other stuff, you know. Mm. Um, and uh, it'll be interesting to see the relationship between him, him and the him and the fair city of Nottingham. You know, he, he might he might come back to Brazil knowing how, how to how to make lace, for example. You know <laughs> he might well do. He might well do. Um, the third player I was going to ask you about is for Renan Lodi. He had a slow start at Forest, which is perhaps yeah. understandable. I think someone made a point. An uh, ex-Forest player, Lewis McGugan, on our last podcast, saying he's probably used to defending one-on-one -on -one three or four times a game and playing for Forest. He's doing it 15 and 20 times a game, but yeah. he's in tremendous form now. Does that uh, Have Forest got a top player, and do you think he could get in, back into the Brazil squad? Because he missed out on that for the World Cup, and I think that was why yeah, he, he came did. here, really. Yeah, well, he, he, he went to Forest in a last desperate bid to try and get himself in. Hmm. Um, and he, he was in for a while at the start of World Cup qualification. Um, the way that they, they were set up was for him to go at left back. And they had him bombing forward and they had Douglas Louise of Villa basically just bl blocking the space. Hmm. So that, that space behind him was, was, was all right because by far the best side of his game is going forward by far. Far, far better attacking fullback than a than, than a defensive fullback, and I I love the quality that that he that he brings. I love the left foot. Uh, I love the quality of crosses that he can strike in, and he can he can cut into the penalty area area as well. He's a player who, when he left Brazil, he left Atlético Paranaense. I had really high hopes of, and I'm a little bit disappointed. I kind of expected more from him. Where did it go wrong for him with Brazil? Well, I think in two ways. One was the final of the Copa America uh, in 21 um, against Argentina. It's the first time Brazil have lost a Copa America on home ground. Mm -hmm. It was 1-0. Di Maria got the goal and it was his fault. And Di Maria mm -hmm. made it very clear that he'd been watching and he, he, he picked out where the weakness was. Perhaps Thiago Silva... There's a little bit wasn't covering as much, but you know, Di Maria knew that his time would come there in that space there. So he carried the can for that a little bit. And then when they were going to call him up, start of the year for World Cup qualifiers, uh, that's a guy to Ecuador, and uh, he hadn't been vaccinated. Ah, okay, S still the height of COVID, and he hadn't been vaccinated, so Ecuador wouldn't let him in. So he, he quickly went to get himself vaccinated, but it was too late. And that that was a huge mistake. It was a massive, massive mistake because uh, he lost his place. And uh, I, I still think they, they could have done with taking him, to be honest. On, uh, in, the, um, in the insignificance of my opinion, I would, I would have taken him as the backup. Uh, and that becomes pertinent because they lost the first choice. You know, they, they had lots of injuries with the fullbacks. Um, whether he gets in in the future, well, who knows? We don't know who's going to be coaching the sides, you know. So there's no, absolutely no at this moment. There's absolutely no idea uh, who's going to be coaching what the idea of play is. So I don't know. Um, everything's up in the air. You know, it really depends who who comes in, and it they're, they're debating for the first time really having a, having a foreign coach. Mm. Um, so I don't know, but uh, I, I would I would st still have him in contention, and especially now he's 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 shaken off the start at, at, at Forest. Where's he? How's Steve Cooper setting up the side, and how how does he figure in it? Well, interestingly, when you say about his attacking qualities, it's, defensively he's been tremendous the last few games. Right. He was right. signed as a wing back, I think, really, yeah. but he's playing in a flat back four, and he. He's got Scarper in front of him now, so with all due respect, he's not getting a huge amount of cover. But uh, he played against the Dharma Triore against Wolves and had him in his pocket. He's done very well of late, so uh, I think Forest fans again have really taken to him. And I, I think having Scarper there has been a big help as well, or perhaps yeah. settling in because it's probably a, again a big culture shock coming from Madrid to Nottingham, and they've commented yeah, on the weather both of them. I'd always hoped that. Going to 
Atletico, working with Diego Simeone would tighten him up as a defender. Mm. So maybe maybe that that's that's happened. Mm. Maybe mm. he's he's had he had he's had some benefit of working with, with Simeone at Atletico Madrid. Mm. Um, one final question that might be difficult for you to answer. I mean, he's on loan from Atletico Madrid. Do you think he could end up at Forest next season, or would he, uh, there's an option to buy him? But if a club comes in. There's massive. There's always ways to do that deal, and Atletico might want him back. Do you have any insight on whether he could stay well, longer term? Are Forest in problems with potentially in problems with financial fair play? Because I saw that that was reported over here as a potential problem with the with the Danilo deal. Uh, okay, I don't don't believe so. Not that we've been hearing over here. So they spent a lot of money, but they have a huge amount of TV money, and oh. their their losses were with they weren't under threat in the championship. They were they were pretty comfortable within it with some. Every club knows a way around the accounts these days, and the COVID yeah. rules were manipulated by everyone, I'm sure. So, if I think there would be enough money there, probably would would that still make it possible? Then, if there is, well, yeah. So, what would he want? Um, about half the Brazil squad that went to the World Cup were Premier League. Which is extraordinary. Mm-hmm. It's, it's extraordinary to think of, and that's the way it's going to be for for a little while. So it's the place to be. So I'd imagine the bigger risk would be another Premier League club coming in for him. Mm-hmm. Um, do you think that the standard of his performances would be worthy of uh, of, of such? Well, at the weekend, who did we beat at the weekend? Uh, Leicester, and I tweeted that him and Aurier were as good a pairing in the Premier League as anyone, including. Trippier and Byrne and White and Dinchenko at the moment, just on current form over a yeah. six to eight week period. So, I mean, if he can do this consistently, then I, I don't see why the top four wouldn't be looking at him, given his age profile. Is is the Paraguayan lad still with you, or Heda? He's uh, yes, he's on loan back in um, South America. And we've got Aguilera as well as well. Uh, or did uh, I did he go to Real Salt Lake or something like that? He's still with us, yeah, but he's nowhere near the first team and Aguilera yeah. as well. Yeah, so uh, Ojeda didn't didn't really come off then. Uh, it's very difficult in the Championship, isn't it? I mean, that's even yeah. more frenetic than yeah. the Premier League, really. I think he was bought as more of a a project, and the the Forest project accelerated to get promoted last season. Mm-hmm. So he might be one that needs a couple of years, but now. Forrester moving forwards rapidly. I mean, obviously Danilo is a big upgrade on Ajeda and yeah. hopefully what we've already got in that defensive midfield area. So I'm not sure if that one comes off long term or not. What do you would, would do you think he's got talent? I think he's a good Paraguayan midfielder, but I, I, w- I wouldn't. It, it it would be a surprise to me if he was a. Uh, if he was to have a great impact on the Premier League, hmm. I, don't, no. I don't, I don't see him busy and all right. But I don't, I don't think there's anything really outstanding about him. Danilo, hmm. I've got high hopes of. And do you think Danilo will, will go straight in? What do you think they'll do with him? <coughs> well, they're quite injury ravaged. I mean, Ryan Yates, who's been our best midfielder, is out with concussion protocols at the moment. So there is potentially a chance he could even start. This weekend, I suspect he'll be on the bench and Jack Colback will start. But he's really... Because Czech Kriate was the defensive midfielder and he got injured during the World Cup. So there's a real vacancy to quickly get him in, Danilo in, just as they got Scarper in quickly. So I would think within two or three games, he'll be he'll be a regular and he'll get his chance. And Forrest will hope he's a Bruno Guimaraes type signing that really flies from the off. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so well, Bruno would come through France and he'd, he'd been yeah, through problems in yeah. France. Yeah, you know it was hadn't it hadn't always been easy for him in France. So he 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 got those teething problems out out the way before coming. This is mm. this is the downside of bringing him straight in from from, from Brazil. The upside mm. is that he's still only twenty one. So there's uh, there's all that time in in front of him. So you'll get good years out of him um, if he does really well. You you may well make make a make a bundle of money on on him selling selling him on. I like mm. him a lot, and I think that dynamism is. Is uh, will stand him in good stead in the Premier League. 
Mm. Well, it's been great to get your insight. Uh, now I've kept you even longer than I and suggested. So thank you very much for that. Just to say to people, if you liked it, uh, do give us a like and subscribe. There's a couple of bits of transfer news as well. Forrester interested in Kaelin Navas and their set sign Chris Wood on loan from Newcastle. Retire a one yet for a couple of months. Uh, personally, I think it's a good deal. It's not gone down very well, but I think it's the kind of signing that, that works. He might not get many goals, but he's a known quantity. And as we've been talking about Danilo, not every signing can be an unknown quantity for me. So I'll be quite happy with that one. Uh, Tim, thank you so much for your time. Very much appreciated. My pleasure. Thank you. And thanks very much, everyone. Enjoy your week. Enjoy your weekend. And we shall see you on Monday.